We're very pleased to have Dr. Struthers with us today. He is a professor here in the psychology department at Wheaton, and I happen to know, which is why I invited him, that he is a very big Tolkien fan. So I am thrilled to have him here with us for our Scholars Corner, which we do annually with Tolkien Society to invite a scholar in and give a talk on Tolkien. So without further ado, Dr. Struthers, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, to, to Laura and uh, Tolkien Society as well as the Wade Center. Uh, when I was asked to do this, I thought for a second uh, about how I wanted to, do, to kind of share with you. And so uh, sort of in keeping with the Christian tradition of offering testimonies, I thought what I would do is I would actually do sort of what I'm calling a Tolkien testimony uh, as, uh, as my way of going about doing this. So if you're expecting something scholarly or uh, you're not going to get scholarly. If you were expecting sort of a literary critique, that's probably not going to happen. I'm not trained to do literary critique. Um, but what I am trained to be is a brain scientist. And if you've seen this, you probably recognize this. This was a part of the Hansen lecture series uh, from last year, actually, uh, that apparently my, uh, my, my manuscript that I sent in has not been received. So I need to kind of follow up with you afterwards uh, to make sure that that has, has, uh, is done. Uh, but uh, this is uh, the, my brain while I was reading uh, The Steward and the King, um, looking at the, the return of the king specifically when Aragorn was being crowned. You can spend time actually hooking someone up and looking at their brain on Tolkien or their brain on Middle Earth. Uh, and I can walk you through what this actually means, uh, but I think it's not really very interesting. Uh, it's, I think, using a way of thinking about, uh, you know, you could put someone in, a, in an fMRI and look at what happens when they, you know, become a Christian or when they you know, have some kind of religious experience. And I think that's only one way of understanding what is going on inside them. And there's a much more rich way of understanding, and that's usually just the language of testimony. Uh, so I need to share with you a little bit uh, about my Tolkien testimony. And my Tolkien testimony begins in 1979. Now, I was born in 1970, which puts me at around 46, uh, but for those of you who are maybe a little bit older, uh, some of the songs that were taught now was My Sharona. Uh, -na 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 -na. Uh, that's My Sharona. Um, I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor, sort of the, the woman's anthem of, you know, kind of getting over a uh, boyfriend or whatever. Uh, the uh, the Pina Colada song by Rupert Holmes, Escape. Uh, if you remember that, if you like Pina Colada, that's right. Um, Ring My Bell is another one. Uh, Sad Eyes, the YMCA, how can you go to a wedding ceremony and not hear the YMCA uh, at the reception? Uh, Fire, the devil went down to Georgia, uh, to Georgia just, when I, just when I needed you most. But the one for me that really sticks out is Heart of Glass by Blondie. Uh, sort of this wonderful kind of disco th song that uh, I remember uh, very, very clearly in 1979. Uh, because in 1979, uh, if you're from the Chicago area, you may remember the blizzard of 79 which happened in January 13th and 14th. Uh, you know, like 28 inches or 20 some odd inches of snow in a 38, six hour period. And this is a really significant event in my own life because my parents from Western Pennsylvania had moved out uh, to, uh, to Chicago area. Uh, and we're, we're living in, at the time, a little town called Minooka. And uh, they, they, you know, I was born in Chicago. They lived in Cicero for a while. They moved to Minooka. And the 1970s was a very difficult time uh, in this nation. Uh, there was a massive recession. Uh, there were, you know, we had people who were uh, being held hostage in Iran. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the winter of 79, I think for my family, kind of broke them. It broke them financially. It broke them, uh, I think, their spirits in a lot of ways. Uh, and this, uh, I remember very clearly this blizzard as well. Um, we were actually uh, stuck out on the road uh, when the blizzard hit, and we had to pull our car over. Um, and my mom actually had to leave the car to go try to get help to get gas. Uh, to uh, So I stayed with my, my, my dad and my brother. And, and I think that was just a real breaking moment for them. Uh, I remember them fighting. I remember them saying, what are we doing out here? Uh, it was a difficult place for them. Uh, and, and I remember just as a kid being just really terrified uh, of kind of what, what's, I mean, I'm 
you know, eight years old, really. Uh, at the time, uh, this is me sort of in third grade. I'll let you pick and see if you can figure out which one's me. It's pretty obvious, I think. Uh, I was in third grade at uh, Minooka Elementary School. And, uh, and while I was in, in there, uh, I also had uh, a classmate who was actually really good at dodgeball, that's my memory, called Nick Offerman. If you remember Nick Offerman, he's uh, from Parks and Rec. He's, I think, Ron Swanson. So he and I were in class together in third grade, it's sort of my brush with, you know, fame. Uh, but at the time, uh, I remember my parents had, had realized that they needed to move back to Pennsylvania. Um, and so we needed to move from Minooka, uh, the little trailer park that I was living in called Shady Oaks. Uh, and I tried to actually find a Google street view of the trailer that we, uh, we lived in, but apparently the Google car never went through there to kind of get the street level view. So all I can really get was like the, the, the above air view. But we, we moved from, uh, from Maple Street, from our trailer on Maple Street in August uh, of 1979 to a town called Oil City, Pennsylvania. Uh, Oil City is where my dad is from, where the, the large side of, uh, or the largest side of my family, which is on his side. Uh, my mom is from a town called Franklin, Pennsylvania, which is just a little bit down the road. So they're these very small rural communities, uh, rooted, obviously, as you can tell, um, originally in the oil industry. Uh, but when we arrived in 1979, uh, Quaker State Motor Oil uh, and Penn's Oil moved their international offices from Oil City to Texas. And so the financial opportunities that we had growing up really weren't that great. So, but I was an eight-year-old kid. I was just, just turning nine years old, entering fourth grade. And one of the things that happened is as we were preparing to leave, back in a time when you had an antenna on top of your house to watch television, guess what was on television? The July before we left. Well, it was The Hobbit. Um, and... I, being a little kid who uh, kind of was just drifting around, about to have my world sort of shaken and transformed, uh, I was uh, kind of in the middle of a trauma, a moving trauma for a nine-year-old. And, uh, and The Hobbit came on and I just absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, the old Rankin-Bass musical. You know, my first interaction with Tolkien was through a cartoon musical. How crazy is that? But all of, all of those, you know, the greatest adventure is what lies ahead. Those things got stuck in my brain. And I sort of fell in love with, with, with what I knew Tolkien to be, which was the cartoon. My parents actually purchased the LP. Uh, which had all of the songs and had all of the dialogue in it. And I know a number of people that I have come into contact with who are scholarly, oftentimes have sort of a, a view of the Rankin-Bass cartoon sort of as not really high culture. I don't really care that they were in high culture. They were my first interaction with Tolkien. And Tolkien is what kept me alive that first year. It was me sort of leaving my own little version of Hobbiton and Minooka and going to the great beyond, you know, the kind of these other areas. And so moving from Minooka to Oil City uh, was in some ways for me sort of moving out from, from Hobbiton to a new world where I would find that the world was a, a lot bigger than what I thought it was. Uh, this is 623 Innes Street. This is where my grandparents lived. Uh, and where I lived, actually. I lived in the, 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 the bedroom, actually, right up here. Uh, my mom and my dad and my, and my brother and I, we all slept in the same bedroom. It was, uh, it was big enough of, of a room for us all to kind of hang out together. And I would uh, move down into the sun parlor where my uh, grandfather's record player was. And I would put this Tolkien LP on over and over and over again. And I memorized every line to this, uh, to this show. Uh, but fortunately, um, they had HBO. They had Showtime. And did you know there was another cartoon that came out? I'm 10, 11 years old, right? Well, actually, it, it came out in 1978. Uh, but it didn't come to showtime until probably about 1980 or 81. And my grandparents had cable. So I actually, if you ever go to, to a hotel, it's not uncommon to find these little pamphlet books for the HBO or whatever it is they have. And you could flip through that. My grandparents would get that. 
every month. And so you could actually look and see what was going to be on. And one, uh, uh, one summer day, I think it was, I discovered that The Lord of the Rings was going to be on. And I saw this about Tolkien. And it was kind of the next thing. And so I stayed up late with my brother, who kind of didn't really care about Tolkien, but he just was excited that we got to stay up late. And at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, the, the Lord of the Rings was on. And so we would get, we got our big bowl of popcorn, and I you know, would lay out on the floor in front of my grandparents' television, and they didn't really care. They thought it was kind of fun that you know their, their 10, 11-year-old grandson was going to watch this. And I fell in love with Tolkien in, in a second way. Uh, now granted, once again, the rotoscoping technique and the, the Ralph Bakshi animation, some would argue, left a lot to be desired. Uh, it was nice for me to see that a character, the, the Bilbo that I knew, uh, was kind of back again, you know, even if it was just for the beginning. It was nice to kind of have that connection and to discover that there was another story that was going to be told. And this story had a, a very different type of villain. This was not a dragon, right? This was something, this was not smog. These were dark riders. And, and even now I can remember the, the terror that I felt as the dark riders were sniffing around when the, the hobbits were underneath, you know, hiding here under the tree and, and just being electrified by that excitement. Now, I'm not one for horror movies, I will say that, but it, it did mark me in a way that made me realize, wow, this is, this is real danger that we're in. Now, keep in mind, uh, I think my grandparents' house for me was a little bit more of a Rivendell. It was a safe place, a homey place, a place where all of my relatives would come. Uh, and so uh, Tolkien sort of kind of became a little bit of a... Uh, Oh, what's a good way to put it? Uh, a little bit of a joke among my family members because Boo, which was my nickname, Boo likes Tolkien. And so guess what they called Bill? They called him Bilbo. And so I kind of also started occasionally being called Bilbo by my family who sort of realized, oh, that's kind of silly, Bill, Boo, hey, Bilbo, Bill, Boo, Bill, Bill, right? So they, would, they kind of gave me this nickname. Uh, and, and so they, they thought it was funny. They thought it was wonderful. They didn't really care much about Tolkien as a general rule. Uh, and so when I was you know, watching these things, I was captivated by the Balrog and by the Fellowship and all of these things. Well, uh, God bless my, my, my family. Uh, they kind of kept it coming. So they found a way to make sure that I could watch The Return of the King, which is another Rankin-Bass cartoon. And, uh, and, and fortunately, uh, I, I began to, as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, begin to be a little more interested in Tolkien, rather than just as a cartoon show like you'd watching Pokemon or Scooby-Doo or something like that. The fact that there were actually books that you could read that had more information just completely captivated me. And so I started to move from kind of watching cartoons and encountering Tolkien through cartoons to encountering Tolkien more in the text. And so as an 11 year old, I, uh, I picked up The Hobbit. Uh, and truth be told, my family actually bought me all four of the books. So I had The Hobbit and I went through The Hobbit, just tore through it three, four times just absolutely delighting in this story. And then I moved into the Fellowship of the Ring. And I have to be honest, the Fellowship was rough. I got to Tom, Dom, to Tom Bombadil, and I didn't really know what to make of it. So that was kind of a stopping point for me. It's almost like a, a new Christian sort of, you know, reading the, the Gospel of John is great, and then you kind of move into Acts, and you're like, oh, I don't know about this. This is a different story entirely. So, so Tom Bombadil was the place where I kind of got stuck, but I loved Bilbo's party. I, I, over and over again, I would read those chapters. And finally, I kind of got to the other side of Tom Bombadil because my notion of who Tolkien was and what the story of the Lord of the Rings was, was constructed through the cartoons. And so as I was reading this, I kind of thought, well, this isn't in the cartoon. What's this all about? And Bombadil was a stumbling block for me. If 
I'm, I'm going to be completely honest. It wasn't until much later that I began to appreciate who Tom Bombadil was and what his space was uh, and, the, and the purpose he served in, in the stories. But eventually I got through and I got to the end of the Fellowship of the Ring. And then I read The Two Towers and I realized, wow, this is pretty interesting stuff. And then I, you know, of course had the old Rankin Bass cartoon, which was a nice little follow up to Bakshi's, which ends sort of at the Two Towers, which was kind of disappointing for me. Um, but, uh, but what I began to realize is that I really identified with the character of Bilbo. For me, Bilbo, I was Bilbo. That was my nickname. And so as an 11, 12-year-old, Bilbo was a character that just fascinated me. You know, his Turkish character. Uh, you know, the fact that he would, would go out and would have these adventures and, uh, and that he was, uh, you know, a critical character in finding the ring and that he comes back again at the Council of Elrond uh, and that he's back there again at the end of Return of the King, uh, that he gets to go across the sea. You know, that just was fascinating for me. And, and Bilbo was a character that I I just identified with. Uh, certainly, uh, I think I identify more with the, you know, in home Bilbo than the, you know, Rankin and Bass Bilbo, although I may look a little bit more like this one uh, than I do. Uh, but also thinking about, you know, even in the, the, the Martin Freeman version. Uh, boy, there's just something about the character of Bilbo that captivated me for about two or three years. That curiosity, that willingness to go on adventures. And Bilbo, um, just you know, stuck with me, and I, I have to be completely honest. Uh, this is when my imagination of what's the whole point of life started to be, you know, activated. Sort of came online, and I began to start asking questions. You know, what does it mean to be wandering through this world? Another thing that I, I, I really liked about the Fellowship of the Ring that also grieved me in a very deep way was the character of Balin. Or Balin. It's tomato, tomato. I guess it depends on how you read it uh, or how you hear it uh, in the movies or the cartoons or the songs or whatever. And the, the character of, of, of Balin was really a significant character for me because for whatever reason, his tomb in the end of the Fellowship of the Ring just was just sort of grieved me in a way that was very, very different from the passing of, of Thorin. I'll be honest. At the end of um, the, the Hobbit, when Thorin passes, there's a part of me that says, okay, yeah, he died, but he really messed up. <laughs> he really, you know, so there was, you know, as an 11-year-old, you're kind of juggling those kinds of senses of justice and all that kind of fun stuff, and he wasn't really a nice guy, and, you know, he should have known better, and he really screwed, you know, the lake people over, and, and, and so I, 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 but the one character that beyond Bil Bilbo that I really loved was Balin. And, and so when you get to the, 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 um, the Mines of Moria and you, I, I, I read that chapter over and over and over again, the um, you know, Ori's hand and, and, and you know, the thought of here were these people who survived, you know, these dwarves that survived the battle of the five armies and they got annihilated in the minds of Moria. For whatever reason, as a, as a 12, 13-year-old, that just crushed me. And so Balin was another character that uh, drew me over from the love of the hobbits to the love of the dwarves. And so, uh, oops, sorry. So I, you know, got to the end of Return of the King and started reading through all the appendices. And I became really fascinated. The appendices got read for a couple of years more than the rest of the text did. If I, once again, I got caught up in the appendices. And being a, uh, someone who had arrived at his elementary school, didn't know anyone, uh, I spent a lot of time in the library. And so I spent even more time in the carousel at the end of the fiction section where the Tolkien books were. And that's what I would do after school. I'd go there and I would read them and I would take the books out. Um, I, I did, I've, in fairness, confession time, I may have taken the Silmarillion out for four years <laughs> without renewing it. May have. And 
Not that I'm encouraging that, by the way. I know we have librarian types here that we need to be sensitive to, to them. But I, I had the opportunity to, to kind of move into the Silmarillion. And the Silmarillion was, for me, as a 12-year-old, unreadable. I just couldn't figure it out. Um, and so I would go, and I'm like, am I pronouncing these names right? And these names are really long, and they're confusing. And oh, yeah, I think I have, you know, I think we have a dance on Friday. You know, I don't know that there's anybody I want to go to the dance with. I'm just going to sit at home and read. And so I would sit at home and read. I wasn't really very social, uh, but I just got caught up in Tolkien, very much a bookworm. Silmarillion was like next level stuff for me, but I couldn't get there. I needed a way to get there. And that's where the Tolkien Companion comes in. This was my Bible. <laughs> This is where I ran whenever I needed to kind of say, who, okay, Holman the Green-Handed, who is that? Okay, I don't remember anything about him. And, all right, Huesta, all right, so, oh my goodness. And so I would flip through this, and I actually read the Tolkien Companion, Tolkien Companion in the way that I wasn't able to read the Silmarillion until much later in life. And so it was this transition book to me. So, you know, J.E.A. Tyler, thank you so much for this because this was uh, my Rosetta Stone to help me interpret what, what was going on here because my little 12-year-old brain just couldn't kind of make sense of that. And so The Tolkien Companion may also have been another book that was taken out of the library for many years and was not returned uh, until much later uh, and with much uh, fine uh, paying that was necessary. So uh, the, the Tolkien Companion really was a way for me to wade into deeper waters. Oh, and then I hit middle school. And I found the other guys in my area who also love Tolkien, and they love Dungeons and Dragons. You know, come on. You guys got to know what about Dungeons and Dragons, right? A game that I can pretend to be a hobbit? Take my money now. <laughs> I'm all in. Losing days, pretending to be a halfling, pretending to be a halfling thief, uh, a chaotic good halfling thief, if you are familiar with that language at all. Yeah, that's kind of what Bilbo is, right? He's kind of a chaotic good halfling thief. He's kind of, yeah, whatever, right? So thinking about um, this in light of kind of like you know, today's day and age, you know, you got have kind of Dungeons and Dragons, you have World of Warcraft, you have you know games that are based on the universes that Tolkien popularized. Uh, you know, thankfully, I was not alive, uh, or I was uh, I was alive in a time when World of Warcraft was not accessible. Otherwise, I'd still be living in my parents' basement <laughs> playing World of Warcraft because my imagination was so activated by Tolkien and these notions of alternate worlds and alternate peoples and, and kind of thinking about, you know, who were the dwarves, right? And, and then even the Middle-earth role-playing game. Oh, my goodness. This is like, I've, I've, I've gone to heaven. <laughs> uh, this is wonderful. And so for me, Tolkien was not just about reading the books. It was also about the playing of being Bilbo, the playing of being Balin, the playing of being a member of these particular races. And, uh, and also, truth be told, my family, once again, they bought me the books. They bought me anything they could get a hold of. It was not Amazon.com land. You had to travel two hours to get to Pittsburgh to find a book and maybe there'd be a Tolkien calendar. And so I would intermittently get these Tolkien calendars for Christmas. Uh, and, and they would be the things, and, and, I would, and I kept them all, right? They were the kind of stashed away like I collect comic books. I'd have the, com, you know, the, uh, the calendars kept away. And, and that's one of the things I love about here at the Wade is they've got all the artwork, all this beautiful artwork that was part of these calendars that were put together by you know, so many different artists. Uh, and thinking also, uh, about uh, just that, that time of my notions of what beauty was. Uh, I had the, the beauty from the books and I had the beauty from the art. And, uh, you know, and I was kind of one of those little geeky kids uh, that, yeah, you know, was interested in kind of pursuing Tolkien perhaps as, a, as something like you could get a job at. 
Being someone whose family members didn't go to college, I had no idea that perhaps you could even study this. And so as I began to find out more and more about who Tolkien was, and that he was, at, that like people actually went to school and there were professors who like studied literature, that would be great. And so what I began to notice is that as my love of the dwarves and the kind of these windows started to open up, I found myself rotating from characters. I went back and every summer I read the Lord of the Rings again. Every summer I read The Hobbit again. And after, I'm on 27 cycles right now. <laughs> and you don't just read the Lord of the Rings the same way every time. Each time you read through it, something different grabs you. And so during junior high, Gimli got me. Gimli? What? Uh, I don't know. It just happened. And there was something about Gimli and the dwarves that just kind of caught me. And Gimli's friendship with Legolas and, and you know, the, the dwarvish language, I dove into that. And there was something about these dwarves who lived underground that sort of fascinated me. They were short like the hobbits, and let's face it, I'm 5'6", I'm not you know, gonna come off as a writer of Rohan or anything like that, but my goodness, the dwarves were just fascinating, and Gimli, for whatever reason, I just became enamored with Gimli. And so the, the kind of ruggedness that kind of, at least I wanted to be in junior high, like a rugged guy, I was like, you know, 90 pounds, but I sort of fancied myself as like, you know, being sort of of dwarvish stock, right? And I was ready to be a, you know, big husky kind of guy, didn't happen. <laughs> a few years later, a few other iterations, I fell in love with Legolas. These elves are kind of an interesting race here. Kind of interesting. Go back into the Silmarillion, go back to the Tolkien Companion, the Silmarillion again, back to the appendices. And I began to fall in love with the character of Legolas for some reason. Not sure why. The notion of uh, that, that picture of Legolas walking on top of the snow as they're going, you know, trying to take the, uh, take the path, the pass. Oh my goodness. That just, I think I watched that uh, because now I had VHS video recorded the back she Lord of the Rings. So I could actually watch it again over and over and over again. And I would go back and when I wasn't reading, I'd watch the videos. And I fell in love with Legolas, this notion that you could be light, that you could walk on snow, that you were an undying creature. Just was incredible. And then, I mean, come on, Orlando Bloom. <laughs> That's just an attractive man, an attractive elf. And, and just the, the elegance of them being portrayed in the movies as well. I mean, man, how can you not at some point fall in love with the race of the elves? I don't know. And how you can kind of walk through the books and not just be delighted in the elven race. Yeah, they got their issues, right? They, they and the dwarves need to kind of get it worked out. <laughs> but Legolas was a character that in high school, right, I wanted to be graceful. I wanted to sort of be beyond what I was, some of a, of a, of a race that was sort of set above. I longed to kind of know what that was, what that was about. And then... Yeah, I sort of, as a good 17-year-old, figured out that I had kind of understood everything. And I knew it all at this point. And I was really a wise old sage, and so I fancied myself a Gandalf for a while. That really I had kind of hidden power, that it would be cool if I was wise and powerful. And, uh, and, and so as, as Gandalf from you know, the Bakshi, to, or excuse me, from the Rankin Bass to the, to the Bakshi, you know, who just kind of kicks butt, to of course, well, yeah, McAllen. I mean, this is, I don't know if you can ever come across a more perfect casting uh, for a character than McAllen as, as Gandalf. Just the, 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 that sensibility. And I remember having conversations with, uh, as I got older too, uh, young men who had grown up playing World of Warcraft. And, and there was always like, well, what are you? Nine out of 10 wanted to be Gandalf. And so in their games, they were always a wizard. That's, that's what they wanted to be. This notion that you could harness magic was just such an attractive thing for, for, for me personally uh, in high school. And then, of course, in, you know, I began to fall in love with Frodo as well. How can you not fall in love with Frodo? Uh, this notion of you know, being the person who has to carry this weight 
uh, to find your way through the, the, the undoable task that is set before you. Uh, I found myself want, you know, having a great sympathy for Frodo as well and identifying with him. So, so in many ways, my Tolkien testimony is about identifying with these different characters for different reasons and different seasons of my life. And as I reflect back on them and I think about, they kind of got me through some things. I needed Bilbo to help me get through the trauma of moving. I needed Gimli to steel myself against the, the and, and Balin against the craziness of starting junior high. I needed uh, Legolas to kind of give me a sense of, uh, uh, of sort of being able to step back and be aloof from what was going on the you know at the end of junior high and the, the beginning of, of high school and I also needed you know Gandalf and Frodo to kind of help guide me through um, high school to help me realize okay this is going to be a journey I'm taking something somewhere bad right and so I need to be wise and so kind of flipping back and forth between identifying with Gandalf after my freshman year and Frodo after my sophomore year and then back to Gandalf after my junior year and so I I would continually come back and so thinking about, you know, Frodo, the old uh, kind of uh, Rankin-Bass Frodo versus, of course, uh, the, the Frodo that we're most familiar with from the movies, um, you know, this is, I think, a, uh, a way for me as a, as a 20-year-old. I think Frodo was someone that I, I returned back to uh, as someone who's just sort of on this journey, and you get an appreciation for it. Now, you'll notice <laughs> there's no conversation about my religious upbringing. And that's because I didn't have one. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I didn't, I mean, I thought churches were like some kind of business that were on the street and they had really pretty windows, but never went in it until once again, you know, uh, when I was, was maybe, I guess it would have been 11, uh, my uncle married uh, uh, my who, woman who is still my aunt uh, and they got married in a Catholic church. And as the first time I really remember being in a church is with, as, a, as a junior usher for my Uncle Dick and Aunt Judy's wedding. And so, okay, this is cool, it's nice and pretty, but I'm gone. And it wasn't until much later in life that I was introduced to this person called Jesus. And all of the things that had been activating my imagination, that had been kind of nibbling around the edges of the longings that were inside of me to be ex to be accepted, to have someone guide me and walk me, to, to be a Gandalf for me when I felt like a Frodo, to, um, to this kind of sympathy for these races or this notion of what kind of you know, person I should be or, or what sort of things I should be longing for really were, were set in me. And I was a, a Tolkienan before I was a Christian, if that makes any sense. The, the meta narrative that was governing my life was one that I was taking from my family, taking from my culture, and trying to allow this sort of what I wouldn't know what it was called at the time, but this sort of meta narrative about purpose, about dignity, about freedom, about responsibility. I was getting all through what I was reading in, in Tolkien because I really had no instruction. Other, aside from that. So when I, I did come to faith, uh, you know, I, I then kind of came to faith in high school, and so I was beginning to kind of see some of the overlap, and I uh, was still reading Tolkien while I was also beginning to read this thing called the Bible. So that I was like, when I said, this is my Bible, I actually knew what I meant when I was saying that. So then I uh, go off to college. And so in college, <laughs> long hair, bad sweaters, small dorm rooms, you guys know what it's like, right? <laughs> so um, thinking about in the, in the late 80s and the early 90s, uh, it, it was fun. Uh, and, and of course, I went to college thinking, all right, I'm either going to be a psychiatrist, I might be a pastor, I could also be a Tolkien scholar. And there may have been another option I was entertaining at the time. <laughs> But we'll, we'll skip over that. So in, in college, what I found was that, yeah, I didn't do so well in those pre-med classes. So becoming a doctor was quickly ruled out. I was also going to a secular school that 
even if I wanted to be a pastor, I don't think there was anyone there who knew what the root was because there were just no faculty members. There were the, the organizations on campus were very, very small for, for Christians to, to hang out with. Um, I got to, to campus excited to take a class on Tolkien, and they didn't have any. They had no classes on Tolkien. They only had classes from some guy called C.S. Lewis. I had no clue who he was, so I wasn't reading his stuff. He was probably trying to, he was probably trying to copy Tolkien anyway. <laughs> So I had complete ignorance of, of this as well as sort of just no opportunities. And well, we're still holding out on the rock star thing, so we'll see if that may happen eventually. Uh, but in college, uh, I, I, I met a young woman and, uh, and she was a desk aide at, my, uh, at my, uh, my dorm. And we began a relationship uh, and, and as I was describing to her as we were sort of beginning this relationship I told her well I, I feel kind of like a Gimli to your Galadriel you're like really really way out of my league and I'm really kind of down here being ugly and big and not you know kind of grumbling and and so and she said I have no clue what you mean I have no idea what you mean, what you're getting at with this, this analogy. I said, well, you're going to have to read these books called The Lord of the Rings. She said, I don't, what are you talking about? Who's this guy Tolkien? Is he like, like is he trying to copy C.S. Lewis? <laughs> and so my wife was reading Lewis all over the place, and I was reading Tolkien, or, well, the woman who would become my wife, uh, was reading Lewis, and I was reading Tolkien, and we were sort of like ships passing in the night here. And so uh, we, uh, as part of our uh, engagement process, I said, look, if we're going to get married, you have to read these books. You have to read The Lord of the Rings. That's a non-negotiable for me. I will not marry you until you have read The Lord of the Rings. And, and she was sort of taken aback by that. I mean, usually there's a lot of other things that, you know, you say, if you have to do this, right, you have to do that. And I was like, you have to read these books. You will not understand who I am unless you read these books. And so she, she agreed. And then I lost her. I lost her for about three weeks because she wanted nothing to do with me while she was reading these books. She would come home from work and she'd say, I can't talk to you. I'd try calling her up on the phone. And I'm like, can, we, can you just talk to me? I can't. You know, they're, they're getting ready to storm Helm's Deep. <laughs> and I lost her every night for about three weeks because she was reading these books and ignoring me. And she got to the end of the books. Uh, and, we, and, and finally, you know, we, we kind of got back together for dinner. And, and she said, you know, if we ever have kids, I want to name our kids after characters in The Lord of the Rings. And that's when I knew I had chosen wisely. <laughs> and that our relationship was not going to be that big of a, of a deal because we were on the same wavelength. We had this love of something. Similar. Yes, we love Jesus together. And we're all on board with that as our uber meta narrative. But we also love Tolkien. And we also love the characters. So there's many layers in which we are so like-minded. And so uh, after we got married, uh, Tolkien became a, a regular theme in our relationship. She would get me, this is a map over in my office, the map of Middle Earth. Uh, she would get me, you know, the, the Alan Lee sort of art prints, uh, posters also up in my office as well. And so Tolkien became, began to be a sort of a thing going back and forth with us. Um, also, uh, she has the Galadriel's necklace, uh, you know, the brooch, or the ring, I'm sorry, it's the ring. She has the ring, uh, you know, so it's, it's kind of a, a fun thing for us to kind of be sort of gifting each other Tolkien things. Uh, but uh, this is Arwen Joy, uh, who has spent some time working here at the Wade Center, uh, goes by AJ, um, and uh, she's, she came out before the movies came out. So we like to joke that she was actually a forerunner. Uh, this is Theoden Andrew. Uh, we couldn't name our son Strider or Aragorn because, well, that would just be creepy because Aragorn and Arwen kind of get married, and we didn't want <laughs> any kind of weirdness going on there. So we figured, okay, we've got a, we've got a half elven. We've got uh, Theoden. Donna loved the character Theoden. She loved him before I did, if I'm honest. Theoden was, in my mind, sort of a secondary character until Donna woke my eyes up to Theoden. 
and and then the movies came out and oh my goodness just completely loved it and but Theo was born uh, you know before the movie came out and uh, and when we were pregnant with our third child our um, we, we found out in, in the summer and and uh, as again even as a th- I guess I would have been, what, 10, 20, 25, or no, 35 year old. I was in my next cycle of reading through the Lord of the Rings again, and I just happened to be reading through the Fellowship of the Ring when we discovered that, and we were beginning to have the conversations well, what do we name this one, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I that very next day got to the section when they're back in the Shire and Sam has married Rosie and Sam goes to Frodo and says we're gonna have a baby wow there's all these other wonderful names we've heard all the places we've been but they seem so big so impressive so maybe over the top and Frodo says well what about Eleanor and so this is Eleanor Rose uh, Ellie, so she is uh, our last, and so if we kind of continue thinking about this notion of who do you identify with, uh, each one of my children, uh, because you know Eleanor, by the way, if you read the appendices, right, the red book that Bilbo hands off to Frodo is handed off to Sam, is when last we hear handed off to Eleanor, and so Eleanor. Mom Rose, Eleanor Rose. And so each of uh, of the kids, when they were born, the day they were born, uh, I got a a bound red copy of The the Lord of the Rings, all the books, kind of all three of them together. And so they're kind of sitting up in each of the kids' rooms. So that's kind of a marker for them. And, uh, well, I'm getting kind of emotional here. I'm not quite sure why I'm getting emotional. It's because I know what my last slide is. You know, who do I identify with now? I actually identify with Sam. This notion of, wow, holy smokes, the journey continues now. And so as I have been thinking about my my Tolkien testimony and the different people that I identify with, you know, the character that probably I would have been least attracted to in the Fellowship of the of the Rings, or the fel- yeah, the Fellowship of the Ring was Sam. In the cartoons, he's a buffoon. He's a buffoon. And you know, in, in the, the, the Lord of the Rings, you know, Bakshi, he's kind of an idiot. And in the, uh, the Rankin Bass, he's kind of sympathetic, but he still comes across a bit as a buffoon. But in the, the Peter Jackson version, as I've gone back and I've reread it, and I've heard other people sort of championing Sam, the more I recognize, wow, this, uh, Sam may be my last. He may be the last one that I kind of land on, and that's not a bad place to land. So uh, we have a little bit of time, so uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, and stop here. But once again, thank you to the Wade Center, the Token Society, and, uh, and Laura. So thank you very much. I just want to let everybody know we have every Tolkien calendar from 1973 to the present in the Good Wade stuff. Center. Good so stuff. if you're missing any of them, you can come and enjoy and I see. May do that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody has any questions um, for Dr. Struthers, we have a few minutes for that. And anybody that's free to come to dinner with us, once we've closed up here, stick around and we will get to have further conversations. So. I, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Julie. Um, so when we did, uh, when Donna was the office coordinator um, for the urban studies program before she became the office coordinator for the political science department, we were over at NOAA's and uh, at dinner. I, I think you were there um, with this. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, this was eight or nine years ago now, but mm-hmm. um, when I first met you all, we walked in, you know, I'm a big um, Tolkien fan as well, but uh, Chris is like, Oh, you know the Struthers are. I'm like, oh, are they? Like, yeah, they've named all the their children. Like, that's kind of weird. I'm like, yeah, that's another level. Of the <laughs> man, you know? and, then, yeah. and then on, I, I stopped saying I'm a fan mm. because I, I felt like that, you know, in a true sort of fanatical fashion. Uh. You know, you can't live up to this. Well. Story. Well, it's it's not a competition. That's the one thing that's nice. It's not a competition, and yeah, naming your children. And you know, I can always say, you know, that is my wife's idea. You know, was, she's the one who said she wanted to do it. But I, I came along as a very willing partner. Uh, 
but yeah, I, I think there is something about, uh, you know, one thing that I kind of, you know, reflecting on my family history as well, uh, you know, names are important in my family. I mean, sometimes people, you know, families will ha place more emphasis on names, others less. No, it sounds good or whatever. You know, I'm, you know, the third William in my family and my brother's named after my uncle and my brother named his son after his uncle, you know, my uncle, our uncle. And so, so names are really kind of important to us in a way that's very different than what I often run across. Uh, you know, some people, and, and not that, you know, ha having a nice sounding name is unimportant or that other people don't think about that. But I, I do remember um, conversations where we th th labored over names and over the significance of the names. And so, uh, you know, Arwen's name comes straight from the book, and it's also a, yo a young woman who was in a youth group that Donna was particularly fond of named Joy. So that's where the Arwen Joy comes from. Um, th you know, Theo, he, um, Donna, you know, said, I want his name to be Theo, you know, Theoden. And that was kind of like, okay, well, all right. Well, we don't want him getting too, you know, headstrong about thinking that he's a king. Um, but, you know, being a, a good, from good Scottish heritage, you know, I actually, you know, spent some time, you know, thinking about, well, you know, well, boy, that little cross, that Saltiri, what, what is that? You know, it's St. Andrew's cross. Well, who's this Andrew? Oh, he's a disciple. Uh, well, you know, and when you look at the character of the, the disciple Andrew, he's kind of the least kingly-ish of all. He's the one who's bringing the children to Jesus. He's Peter's little brother who seems to not be the one of the highest, but is sort of like the, the disciple for the common man. And so you find there are more St. Andrew's churches around than almost any other uh, disciple. And so for me, Andrew was, was a nod to my Scottish heritage as well as a nod to the disciple. So that's why Thayod and Andrew fit really well together. And Eleanor Rose, that was just, that was serendipitous. You know, that was just like, you know, I'm just reading this right here, right now. And okay, that's like, you know, that's a sign from God, you know. Uh, so as, as silly as that sounds, but it just, for, for we were just like, yeah. That, that settles it, you know, Eleanor and Rose, the, you put those two together. So, so for us, you know, Ellie is really the one who has the double whammy, you know, both of those characters, uh, but they don't sound like Tolkien characters, like Eleanor. It's spelled by the way, like it is in the book, not the way that it is in, you know, uh, typically. So, so yeah, I don't want people to feel as if somehow their Tolkien devotion or affinity is somehow less unless they name. We also, by the way, named our dog Winnie Eowyn. Uh, so our dog was so, you know, you can do what you want with that, too. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we've, uh, yeah, names were always important for us, and so the names are, are a constant reminder, and, and they're a little bit of a legacy. You know, our kids will always have that red book, um, and, they will, and their name is tied to part of the reasons why uh, Don and I are together, so, because she read the book. <laughs> okay, yes? They, they do. I think their engagement point initially has was the movies um, when they hit junior high because obviously the movies came out like two thousand, you know, one, two, three, or whatever it was, uh, and so we didn't let them watch that. I mean, you can't let them watch that stuff when they're five. They'll be traumatized by Gollum uh, or by the Balrog or something. So, um, so they kind of were around the edges, uh, and and uh, with uh, I think with each of them, I've read The Hobbit out loud to them when they were little, um, and so they're familiar with it. Uh, and AJ, uh, the eldest, she I think has. Uh, because of her time here at the Wade, she's also a little more of a Tolkienophile. Uh, Theo has uh, is familiar with the stories, is familiar with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Um, but I, I, I think I gave him the gene for his love of music more than my love of, of Tolkien as much. I think he's familiar with it, and he's okay with it. He's not nearly as devoted as I was because... I think emotionally he's in a much better place than I was when I was 14. Um, so he didn't need to go running to the library <laughs> to read. Uh, so, but he's more musically inclined. And uh, Eleanor, our sixth, uh, our sixth grader, she's beginning to jump into it now. So as an 11-year-old, she's right when I was, when I was starting to read it. And she's picking up uh, uh, on that, that, that world of fantasy, the world of, um, of Tolkien and Lewis, because now she's got up from both sides, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and other types of, of uh, young adult fiction. So she's going to be a reader, too, which just delights me. But she's also a bit of an actress. So she, uh, she, I, I may want to yeah, 
yeah, she's in Beauty and the Beast at the junior high. I think here in a month, so she might not be able to help out with the with the plays. But I think she would totally dig stuff like that. Yes. So you had your wife read um, Tolkien's work before mm -hmm. the, before the two of you got married. Did she make you read this work? No, she didn't. I had a lot of other more significant personal stuff I had to work on, uh, like. <laughs> getting my act together. Uh, I think she was less concerned with what I was reading and a little bit more concerned with uh, me sort of you know, uh, building character in my life. Um, she did not need to do that. Uh, so, but, so yeah, that's kind of a joke. Is like, I just asked you to read a book and you actually made me do like a hundred things. So, uh, but they were, they were things that I needed to do. So, so yeah, but no, nothing like that. She's, a, she's not what I would call a fiction reader. She's much, you know, I mean, she, she, you know, likes Lewis, uh, you know, likes the, uh, the, uh, the Space Trilogy and, uh, and some of the Narnia books, but she doesn't have that love of fantasy novels or fiction novels. She's more of a Dan Brown kind of person. She likes, um, uh, you know, like, <coughs> hey, there's a, there's a virus and it kills everybody on the planet. You know, that's kind of her, her fiction. Um, but, the, but the one soft spot that she does have is, is for, for Tolkien's works, for The Lord of the Rings. That, that's, and that's how I kind of knew, yeah, that's, that's the woman for me. <laughs> yeah, Laura? I'm always fascinated by hearing stories of where the imagination begins to engage mm -hmm. your spirit before you find faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to the Definitely. Um, can you delve into that a little bit more as to maybe what threads from Tolkien aided you in that process, other than the character affiliation mm -hmm. and knowing that Jesus was kind of filling all of those things yeah. for you that you were longing for? I think there's, uh, f for me, the, uh, I identified some of them, but I think that notion of, of self-sacrifice uh, was in the face of overwhelming evil was something that, uh, I, I saw in Frodo and uh, and um, and to a lesser extent I think in Bilbo in his sort of going along with the with the dwarves it was more the adventure but uh, but I think it really was that notion of like what things will I die for you know what will be you know what would be the the things that I would put my life on the line for um, and what kind of character does it take to be that person um, that for me was more of a of a, of a nebulous question. Uh, as I was kind of wondering, you know, rather than saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sinful, you know, I'm like Isildur or something like that, you know, that I'm easily corrupted or, or, or any of those things. For me, it was, uh, and even as I came to faith, you know, my, my coming to faith was less about, boy, I'm a horrible sinner and I'm going to hell if I don't believe in this Jesus guy. And it was much more, I was drawn to the beauty of the gospel irrespective of my own condition. Just that the story of the gospel had an intern has an eternal beauty to it that 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 kind of compels me to come forward. It really does. And there are parts like the the sacrifice of Frodo, the the the, the love that Sam shows for Frodo as well, which I don't think I think I mentioned. I didn't really begin to appreciate that until much later in life. <laughs> Uh, those th that notion of what love will do was a beautiful narrative that compelled me and it sort of create rather than that like what can love do for me it's what can love do not just for others but for the universe for the world that I, I walk in that was the thing that really caught my imagination I think uh, I think that's probably the one that is most significant um, other themes uh, I, I think uh, we're uh, this notion of reconciliation as well. Um, I've uh, I shared a little bit of it in the Hanson lectures last year, but uh, you know I, the two characters that I you know Legolas and Gimli, you know, th you know here are two who should hate each other, and they kind of start out really disliking each other, but they you go to the appendix. They sail over the seas with each other. The Legolas, you know, kind of bargains for him to get access to the Undying Lands. That notion of reconciliation among historic enemies 
uh, for me was something that also just fascinated me as well. Now, it's not, I, I wouldn't say that I had any historic enemies or anything like that, but it was, there was just something about, you know, being drawn to those two races at two different points of time for two very different reasons. And then, you know, the history of them actually having good relationships and then they have a war with each other and now they don't even talk to each other. But now you have two who are far apart who've, come together and are reconciled um and, and you know of course the whole thing with you know Gimli and the the locks of hair from Galadriel and they're putting the gems and the gems then go to the you know they, they go up to the oh my goodness there's just so so many beautiful stories it's beautiful it's beautiful there's no other way to put it but how now there's this newfound love between these two races goodness if that doesn't excite you I'm just kind of bouncing up here, just just even reflecting on the memory of thinking about that. Those were things I think that were set in my imagination. That when I realized they didn't, they were not myths. Uh, and to kind of quote Lewis, they're true myths. These are things that are actually real uh, in the gospel, in the Christian story. And that my heart was longing for these things, these notions of beauty and sacrifice and reconciliation. Uh, th those would be the ones I think that are more spiritual in, in nature. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh.